Hey y'all, hey, it is Dr. Cherry. I am here with um, another lecture. Today we are going to be dealing with uh, chapter four. Chapter four is essential crisis intervention skills from the crisis assessment intervention and prevention textbook by Jackson Cherry and Erford, the third edition, uh, 2018. All right, so let's get started. So for starters, um, throughout this textbook and throughout this chapter, we're gonna look at essentially what are micro skills. And so micro skills refers to specific competencies for communicating effectively with others. So it's how we convey a message to others in um, various aspects. And so as we're looking at essential crisis intervention micro skills, we wanna compare the basic counseling skills to your crisis counseling skills, okay? Uh, one thing I do want you to be aware of as we move into the section talking about micro skills um, is the terminology. A lot of people um, know micro skills as interviewing skills. So interviewing skills was the term and they've since changed it to micro skills. So let's look at the comparison. So as we look at the comparison between basic counseling skills versus crisis counseling skills, you first of all wanna understand um, the contextual application. So if you're having you know, a basic counseling session, your communication is gonna be a little bit different. The urgency is gonna be a little bit different versus a crisis counseling where you're doing psychological first aid. You're immediately dealing with the crisis in the moment. And so the focal point um, between the two is what is the contextual application? Where am I? How are things set up? Am I meeting a client in my office or are we standing outside of a burning house? And so between the two, between basic counseling and crisis counseling, um, all of those, you want to use your basic counseling foundational skills. Uh, you're listening, you're being empathetic, um, your presence. And so the main goal with your foundational skills is to build a therapeutic alliance. You want to make sure that your client knows that you're present and you're available for them. Okay. And so when you are applying your basic counseling skills in a crisis situation, the main three components that you want to look at are the ability to listen, to be empathetic, and to respond skillfully. Again, the three vital components of your basic counseling skills that are applied in a crisis counseling situation um, is, are to listen. You definitely wanna listen, and, you, and I wanna break this down. You wanna listen and you wanna make sure that you hear the client's entire story. You don't want to just listen um, to talk. You want to listen and hear the things that are said and the things that are unsaid. So you want to listen, you want to be empathetic, and you want to respond skillfully. Being empathetic includes making sure that the client doesn't feel like you're brushing them off, that they don't feel like their crisis is menial to you. No matter what the crisis is, different people deal with crisis differently and they respond differently. So you wanna make sure that you're empathetic and not comparing, You know, not thinking, well, you know, at least your whole house didn't burn down. Like that's not very empathetic. Um, and you wanna respond skillfully. One of the best ways that you can respond is by being present, right? Oftentimes you do not have to just give an answer or come up with a cliche, but you just simply want to show that you're present and that you're available. And so what are the two main goals of crisis counseling? We've already looked at the vital components that you want to uh, take from your basic counseling skills, but what are the two main goals of crisis counseling? And those are number one, to develop a safe therapeutic environment, right? Number one, to develop a safe therapeutic environment. And then number two, to develop an effective therapeutic alliance, right? So first, the environment, and secondly, the alliance. Um, you want your client to be able to trust you, to be able to trust that if you don't have the answer, that you're going to look for the answer, to trust that you're not just going to give them cliches, to trust that you're going to be an advocate for them, to trust that you're not going to just judge them, okay? So the two main goals of crisis counseling are to develop a therapeutic environment and to to develop an effective therapeutic alliance. And so how do you do this? You do this by what we know as building a rapport. The rapport deals with 
the interaction with the client. And it starts from the moment you interact with the client and it goes through the entire process. Building a rapport is a way for a client to learn to trust you, to learn to trust that you're going to show up when you say you're going to show up. Um, you wanna develop a supportive relationship with the client. You don't want the client to feel like their you know, concerns are being minimized or they're being brushed off. You know, so you know, as you're building rapport, a lot of that has to do with your presence. Um, and I want you to be mindful. Oftentimes we'll run the risk of wanting to share that we've been through the same thing, right? Um, and that's, you know, some form of self-disclosure. Now there are forms of self-disclosure that are appropriate, but you want to be mindful not to make the moment about you. So, you know, if a client is dealing with, like we just used the example, their house burning down, you know, you don't want to say to them like, yeah, my house burned down 10 years ago and, you know, we built it up better than before. That may be your experience, but what if this client doesn't have insurance? What if, you know, this client lost something literally irreplaceable, you know, in that fire, like a life? you know, the, the life of their parent, their child. Um, so you want to be mindful about doing self-disclosure because it could come across as you minimizing their situation. And whatever you do, you don't want to make the moment about you, okay? So there's a hierarchy to the micro skills. Um, you can find this image almost anywhere if you just simply Google the micro skills hierarchy. This one was created by Ivy, Ivy and Salaquet, 2014. And so... Towards the base, the biggest portion of this hierarchy is going to be your basic listening sequence, and we're going to get into that. But this hierarchy of skills, you know, has a lot to do with ethics and multicultural and wellness. And keep in mind, when you're dealing with someone, oftentimes it's almost natural for you to deal with them from your own lenses, right? The way you culturally see things. Um, but you know, I encourage you to put your lenses to the side and try to understand how the client um, is experiencing this and what does this mean to them and their culture so you don't run the risk of actually being tone deaf to something really vital like a crisis. So even with the micro skills, I want you all to be mindful that counseling deals with the entire brain. There are things in the brain that are activated when you're dealing with crisis, um, when you deal with any kind of counseling, but specifically crisis. And so the brain is activated a little bit differently. If you all get a chance, I want you to do some research around how the brain reacts to crisis. Um, I say that because even as you're practicing your own micro skills, you need to be mindful that for the client in the midst of crisis, certain things may shut down. Uh, their ability to recollect very some, something extremely simple, um, you know, like their mother's phone number or, you know, anything like that, it might be difficult for them to, you know, think of those things right off the cuff because they're in the midst of a crisis and their brain is functioning in fight or flight mode. And so as your brain is going through this process, uh, you know, you began to do what we call attending skills. And we're going to look at the specifics of the attending skills, but we're going to be looking at the nonverbals, the eye contact, the body position, the vocal tone, silence, and active listening. I have the slide titled, I really do or I really don't care. Um, because oftentimes the things that you do say and don't say can make someone feel like either you really care or you really don't care. You want to be real mindful of that. Ask yourself, what message is my presence sending? Is my presence sending a message that I'm here, I'm all in and I'm present? Or do my message say, I'm in a rush. This is really, you know, not a good time. Uh, your crisis, you know, really threw my day off and, you know, I'm preoccupied. What does your presence or your attending skills say um, to the client about you? So in your attending skills, I want you to be mindful that counselors, you're not just counseling with words, but you're doing so with body language and with nonverbal cues. A client will feel more trusting and more ability, more willing to open up to you if they feel like you're really invested and that you're in tune with them and that you're paying attention and that you care. So let's look at what our nonverbal say. Um, our nonverbal will tell a client if they're interested, um, if they're uninterested, if they understand the client's issue. Um, 
And keep in mind, if you don't understand something because of a cultural difference, ask. Ask the client, you know, be, be willing to ask. Say, hey, I'm not very familiar with what the Buddha statue means in your culture. Would you mind explaining that to me? Um, you know, and no, they may say that they're, you know, hypothetically, they may say that, you know, they're Buddha broke. And you may be thinking, okay, it's a doll, right? If you come from a very, you know, set of lenses that doesn't recognize something like that as being important or symbolic. And so you want to make time to say, tell me, tell me what that Buddha means to you. Um, tell me more about your culture and what that means. And a client usually will be willing to share their experience, especially something that's important to them, so that you and the client can be on, you know, on the same page on different terms. Okay. Keeping with the theme of, um, you know, of lenses, let's look at eye contact. So eye contact is really important to understand based upon the client's cultural interpretation of it. So for many people, you know, in the Western culture, we'll look you straight in the eye and we'll focus on what you're saying. However, from many Asian cultures, uh, they won't make direct eye contact. They'll look down as a form of respect. So you want to know from the client what that means. And just simply ask, you'll be surprised at how far a question can go. You know, you can simply say to your client, I notice that, you know, when I, um, I ask certain questions that you kind of look away and look down. One, the client may be very unaware that they're doing that. And two, you know, they may just feel like, oh no, this is just, you know, my normal behavior. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to try to force the client to look at you. You don't like, well, can you look at me in my eye when we're talking? You don't want to do that. Um, remember, this moment is about them and their comfort level. Also, when it comes to eye contact, if someone's experiencing a crisis that may be shameful to them, like a rape or some kind of, you know, violation, they may not feel like looking you in the eye while they're telling you the story because they feel a sense of shame, um, a, a sense of vulnerability. And so at that one moment, again, your purpose is presence. Your purpose is finding out from them, how can I best support you? So you wanna know what eye contact means. Again, when it comes to eye contact, you don't wanna stare somebody down, right? You just wanna make natural eye contact, with, which means if you look away, you know, periodically, that's okay. You don't want to stare them down. You don't want them to feel like you're boring your eyes into their soul. Um, also too, with that, uh, for instance, with a lot of African-Americans, African-Americans will often look at you directly in the eye when speaking with you, but they may kind of look down um, or look away when they're listening to what you have to say. And so again, you, know, you then don't want to be like, look me dead in the eye when I'm talking to you. You know, one, this isn't a dictatorship. Remember, you're trying to build rapport. You're trying to establish a healthy therapeutic alliance, a healthy environment, okay? Body position is just as vital um, as your nonverbals and your eye contact. And so your body position, and we're gonna, you know, go through these when we go through the solar acronyms, but your body contact should, in, should convey interest and involvement. And so you want to do a couple of you know, things. You want to make sure you're facing the client. You want to make sure your, your body is in an open and attentive body posture, meaning you don't want to fold your arms or fold your leg or cross your legs. You don't want to sit behind a barrier. You know, when you're doing one-on-one -on -one therapy with a client or even group work, you don't want to sit behind a desk and have a barrier between you and the client. You want to lean forward a little bit to show interest. You don't want to kind of slouch like you're really bored and ready for this to just be over. Um, and so you, you wanna look at how your body is presenting itself. I know we're in the age of COVID right now. And so distance is a really, really key thing. And that's something that's has, gonna have to be navigated. But you know, before COVID, a normal distance was about two to four feet apart, you know, whatever somebody was comfortable in their personal space. And that's according to Western culture standards. Um, but to some people, especially now, you'll have to be at least six feet apart, you know, and you might feel more comfortable with your client wearing a mask. So you just want to be mindful of how that comes across. One thing that might be important is I recently um, purchased some masks 
and the masks um, have a clear opening. Uh, I'll show them to you. So these are the masks that I recently purchased. My background is not. So they're clear on the inside. So if I'm talking to a client who may be hard of hearing, this is a really, really good tool to have. The good thing with these, I, they come in different colors. Um, I have burgundy, black, pink, and gray. I think they all came in that packet. But at least you can still see the client face-to-face -face that way. And you can, you know, look at, you know, fully body language. You'd be surprised in this day and time how, ma how masks have kind of hindered us from seeing a person's whole body posture, you know, facial, I'm sorry, our, the whole body, their whole facial expression. So, you know, something like that is a really good tool to have. But one of the main things with body position is you want to make sure that you're safe. Um, when, if you're in a room with the client, you want to make sure that the client is not between you and the door. Um, and also, uh, talking about being safe, if you're in a crisis situation and a client is feeling suicidal or homicidal, you want to be conscious of the distance that you are from that person. You know, if they're homicidal and, you know, they have a gun or a weapon, you know, although you're there to help them, you're also there to be wise and to be safe. So you want to make sure that you're not in harm's way. The fourth one we want to look at is vocal tone. I want you all to keep in mind that your voice is pretty much your therapeutic tool. So you have to be mindful of your pitch, of your pacing, and the volume. And you want to be mindful that these things can have a huge impact on the client's emotional response. If you have a calm and soothing voice, that can really be helpful, you know, during someone who's in emotional distress. Um, and you might want to modulate your voice to comfort and to de-escalate, right? Um, the textbook talks about vocal underpinning and vocal underpinning, under, I'm sorry, vocal underlining is when you kind of just uh, reiterate a, a certain word. Like you could say to a client, it sounds like you're really, really stressed out. And so you want to put that emphasis on really, because, you know, you're doing vocal under underlining. You're letting them know that I hear you. I hear you. Um, and I'm taking everything you say to heart. I try to tell uh, students all the time not to use certain phrases with clients. Don't, do, don't use phrases like calm down or just relax. If they're in a crisis situation, it's probably going to be a little difficult for them to calm down or relax. And so you don't want to put yourself in a position where you're telling them what to do. You know, you want to be there and be present. You know, yelling at a client is not going to be beneficial. Even if they're on 10, you can kind of calm them by the pace and the tone of your voice. And just like the tone in your voice, one that's really key is silence silence. You want to learn to take comfort in silence and in pauses. Don't feel like you have to fill the space with random words or with a lecture or even a preachy moment. It's okay to just be silent and allow your presence to speak for itself. Your client may be trying to explain something horrific that happened and in the middle of explaining it, they start crying and they fall silent. Give them a minute, give them a minute. They are trying to process, especially in a crisis, what just happened. They're trying to make sense of it. And so you don't want to fill in those, gap with, those gaps with words. You don't wanna create this sermon concept of you know, trying to give them all these great cliches and you know, this whole big pep talk, just be present. Silence is powerful, just be present. Just like active listening is powerful. Um, active listening, um, back Egan in 2013, he developed a conceptual, a conceptual framework um, for active listening using nonverbal com communication tools. And so he came up with this acronym of SOLER, S-O-L-E-R. And so the SOLAR acronym kind of goes back to what we were saying about body posture. And the SOLAR acronym, the S stands for squarely. You squarely want to face the client. Um, the O stands for open. You want to have an open um, and a welcoming posture. The L is for lean. You want to slightly lean forward to convey your interest. 
The E is eye. You want to maintain um, respective, culturally appropriate eye contact. And then the R is for relaxed. You want to try to be as relaxed and as natural with the client because um, your goal is to put them at ease. Okay. I'm going to repeat those. And that's solar, S-O-L-E-R. The S is for squarely, squarely face the client. The O is for open, having an open body posture. The L is for lean forward, showing interest. The E is for um, eye contact, culturally appropriate eye contact. And then the R is for relaxed. You want to have a, a relaxed and a natural body posture position. Then we come to the basic listening sequence. What is the basic listening sequence? The basic listening sequence, it, it encompasses the emp empathetic skills of active listening. And there are three main goals in the ba basic listening sequence. The first goal is you want to find out what is the presenting issue? What is the real problem? Two, you wanna find out facts around the presenting issue. And then three, what are the core emotions associated um, with the presenting issue? Now, the number one, the presenting issue is really, really powerful because that's going to involve you doing a lot of listening. The client may say, you know, I'm really, really tired of my husband, you know, coming home from work, leaving his clothes everywhere, eating dinner, then just leaving the food on the table, leaving his plate on the table. Like, like, I just want him to, you know, put his, put his plate in the sink. And so what's the real presenting issue, right? Is the real presenting issue that his clothes are everywhere and the dishes are on the table? Not necessarily. In this case, it sounds like the presenting issue is the client is feel like they are not being helped, that they have you know, a lot going on and they kind of feel like they're carrying the weight by themselves. You know, Something like this, we would kind of go further. Like when else, can you tell me about another time that you felt you know, like people just kind of left you holding the bag, right? So you wanna know what the real presenting issue and then you want to get facts around that issue. So again, tell me about another time that you've experienced not being assisted or kind of feel like you're carrying the weight by yourself. And you want to go through facts. Now, we go through the basic listening sequence by doing some active listening tools, meaning by uh, using open and closed questions, by encouraging, by paraphrasing, by reflecting feelings, and even summarizing. And so with your open and closed questions, that's where you can get many of the facts. Um, and then you want to really get to the core emotion. Do they feel helpless? Do they feel alone? Do they feel frustrated? You know, so you want to get to the core emotions. And so just keep it in mind that as you're going through this uh, basic listening sequence, it's almost like you have a box and you're simply just trying to unpack this box one piece of wrapping paper at a time. Okay. So I've attached a couple of videos for you all to watch on the next few slides. The first one is about open and closed questions. So when you're looking at open questions, your open questions are going to help you get some really in-depth information. And so your open questions would be things like what, how, could, would, and even sometimes why. Now, why is definitely, it can definitely be an open question, but you have to understand and be careful with why, because it can cause a client to be defensive or criticized or put on the spot. Um, so you want to be mindful of how you word question that forms with why. A good open question that starts with why is, you know, why, why am I here? I think Yann Van Zandt, she uses that phrase a lot, um, but a good why question, why am I here? And that's usually going to give a pretty detailed answer where well, you're here because my husband and I can't get along and he keeps leaving the dishes on the table. And so it at least opens some kind of dialogue. Um, so keep in mind what, how, could, would, and sometimes why are all open questions. A closed question are questions that you want to use to get very solidified facts. They're usually yes, no questions. They give you concrete information, um, you know, those are really, really good, especially when we talked about the basic listening sequence, to get a lot of facts surround, surrounding the information. What year were you born? What year did you get married? What year did the house burn down? Those are examples of uh, closed questions. When we look at questions, we also want to look at leading questions and negative interrogat interrogatives. So a leading question um, usually contains a hidden agenda, and it's something like, mm, you don't really want to kill yourself, do you? 
um, you know, the hidden agenda is you're kind of leading them to say the right thing. Um, so we want to try not to use those. Just like negative interrogative, interrogative, interrogatives, please forgive me, y'all. Uh, that's a question where you, you're kind of forcing a client to agree with you. Like, you know, don't you think you should leave him if he's abusing you? Or wouldn't you be happier if you just put the dishes up yourself? You know, so you want to be mindful of those two. You don't want to use those um, if you don't have to. I can't imagine a time when you would have to, but you just want to be mindful that they're there and that it could sound, it could be very easy to want to throw that in. So when you get a chance, I want you to go through and watch these quick one minute videos. Um, the first one that we just kind of looked at was about open and closed questions. Then there's a video here about reflecting feelings, um, you know, and making sure that you're really understanding and empathizing with the, what the client is going through. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the next uh, video talks about paraphrasing and summarizing, being able to repeat back to a client what they gave you and, you know, in your own words um, and making sure that you two are on the same page, you know, so let's go back to the client talking about um, the dishes you know, uh, you could paraphrase by simply saying, it sounds like you're frustrated when your husband doesn't put, doesn't put the dishes in the sink. Yeah, that's a pretty decent paraphrase. Something a little bit better might be, it sounds like you have a lot of work to do and no one's helping you out. Yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. I feel like I got a whole lot of work to do and they don't care. They just put their clothes everywhere. You know, reflecting feelings would be an example of, that sounds really frustrating. Gosh, that must be really overwhelming. How are you dealing with that? Okay, so you wanna reflect the feelings, you wanna do some paraphrasing and you wanna do some summarizing. Another area that's really, really vital is how to de-escalate a situation. Um, this is a really good video clip. I look forward to you all watching this. But when you know a client is frantic and they come in you know, the last thing you want to do is be frantic with them or accusatory or, you know, talk to them like their problem isn't that important. Um, you want to take a minute to validate them, validate them and hear them out and understand what got us to this point. Um, and just be mindful to always keep your composure, even if a client is really, really frustrated and going off. And they may have said some really, you know, unnecessary things to you. It's not about you. Don't take it personal. This moment could simply be about all the people that have let them down over time. And they're just taking out on you because you're the one person that's listening. And so usually when something like that happens, I often tell my clients, thank you. Thank you for trusting me enough to share that with me. Let's look at it. Let me, let me help you with that. Let's look at it. I don't need your help. Now y'all always say y'all want to help and y'all don't never help. That sounds horribly frustrating. I don't think I'd want to feel like that either. Is there any way that you can kind of talk to me and, you know, we can just kind of look at it, look at everything. I know you've told the story a million times before, but I really, really want to be here to support you right now. Y'all always say that, whatever, but keep in mind, your whole goal is to help them understand that you are on their side and that you are there to validate and support them. Okay. All right, so here's a few references uh, for you all to review um, in the case that you're looking for some interviewing skills or micro skills, especially in a multicultural world. Um, the, the text by Angela Lewis is really, really good. Um, Ivy um, and Daniels, both of those, both of these books are really, really great talking about micro skills and what to do for them. Okay, I know many, much of this may come as a repeat. You learned a lot of this in your helping skills class, but I do hope I lent a little bit of insight on how to just be present. That is the number one goal that you should always have for yourself, how to be present and be available to the client so that we can go from crisis to basic counseling. Okay, I hope that helped. You all have an amazing day. I'll see you on chapter five.